Greetings and welcome. This is Corey from the Box Scholar YouTube channel. I have a really interesting video for you today, and it's about Bach's use of tempo and his use of numbers and letters to symbolize certain elements of tempo relationships. Uh, some of you might be aware that I've been involved with Bach tempo research for quite some time now, actually since 1992 when I was in graduate school. And I stumbled across what I believe to have been a monumental discovery that Bach actually knew his tempi in beats per minute, even though he had no metronome, but he had a system in which he uh, had various relationships between tempi, and he had this, this whole sort of organic system in which he used uh, various tempi to achieve certain durations of time in his music. For example, one movement might be at such and such tempo, tempo A. Another movement might be tempo B, like say a prelude and fugue. And then, and those tempi might not even be related, but this piece played at this tempo and this piece played at this tempo result in say equal durations, for example. I've pointed this out in previous videos on my channel, so you can look for that. Also look for my video where I explain uh, the uh, mathematically correct tempo matrix, because that's where I get my tempi from. The actual numbers comes from a matrix of mathematically ideal or mathematically perfect numbers that fit in to this whole system. I believe Bach used that. I believe Bach used that system because I've analyzed uh, most of his works and that's how I've come to this conclusion. So I'm going to apply that to the symphonias today, but before I do that, I want to talk about uh, just a little aspect of the Goldberg Variations. If you're familiar with Bach's Goldberg Variations, you, you know that there is a theme called aria. It's in the style of a, of a sarabande. You have 30 variations, and then you have the aria again at the end. Now, Bach was under no obligation whatsoever to put the theme at the end. I don't know any composer or any um, work that's a theme and variation from any composer that has the same theme at the beginning and the end. Most composers would have simply written the theme, they would have written the variations, and then they would have ended it there. Or in Bach's case, maybe he would have written the fugue or something at the end on, on one, of the, the, one of the themes. But Bach didn't do that. Bach used the theme at the beginning and the theme at the end, the exact same theme. You see the symmetry? Same in the beginning as in the end. Alpha, Omega from the Bible. You know that Bach was a religious man and he, he highly valued Alpha and Omega and he, he used that symbolism in his music. <clears throat> so the Goldberg Variations then with the aria at the bookends symbolizes the Alpha and the Omega and it also symbolizes unity because they're both unified by the same tempo. Since they're the same piece, you play them at the same tempo. That definitely is, is a given. Okay, we can assume that to be true. So that's the same tempo. Now, I found through my analysis of Bach's works that he did this many other times. He doesn't always do it. He doesn't do it in every work. He does, but he does from now and then, from time to time. He, uh, you can see the work of symmetry in his, in his uh, compositions. Symmetry in that the first piece or the first um, aria or the first song or the first chorus, whatever it may be, is the same as the last. I found this to be the case in some cantatas. I found this to be the case in some chamber music and some organ works and some other keyboard works. So this does happen from time to time. But I'm just pointing it out in the Goldberg variations just because that's so obvious. 
It's so obvious that we don't even, we take it for granted. But remember, Bach didn't have to put the aria at the end, but he did in order to symbolize that um, unity of the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. Now let's turn our attention to uh, the symphonias. Symphonia number one has 21 measures. This is a... That one there. Symphonia number 15. Symphonia 15 has 38 measures. Of course, that's the 15 is the last one. He, he wrote 15 symphonias or 15 three part inventions. Number one has 21 measures. The last one, number 15, has 38 measures. 21, 38. For those of you that know about Bach's use of symbolism or have seen my, uh, some of my other videos on that, I, have, I do have a video on Bach's symbolism. For those of you that know about that, know clearly that 2138 spells Bach. 2138 B A C H. So what Bach was doing here was he was he was putting his signature into the bookends of the symphonias. B A C H. B A in the beginning, C H at the end. Now this is only the beginning. This is only the beginning, because if you count the number of 16th notes, you don't, even have, you don't have to count the 16th notes. You just say there's 21 measures of 4-4 four, four in Symphonia 1. Each measure has 16 16th notes in it, and it's pretty much all constant 16th throughout the whole thing. I don't think there's any place where there's no 16th in, in, in some voice. So it's from the beginning to the end, although not in the very last measure. From the beginning up through the end of measure 20, you have only 16th notes, just going like this. Now, if you take Symphonia 15, Symphonia 15, if you, uh, if you uh, not, don't include the 32nd notes, there are little spurts of 30-second notes in there. But if you uh, take those away and just think, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If you just do that through the whole piece for actually for 37 measures, he has pretty much 30, 16th notes all the way through. So you have constant 16ths in one, in constant sixteenths in, in number 15. There are a total of 336 sixteenth notes in Sinfonia 1, and there are a total of 342 sixteenth notes in uh, Sinfonia 15. When I say 342 sixteenth notes, I don't mean you count them and you get three, 342. I mean from beginning to end, 38 measures equals the, the time value of if you had 342 16th notes. And Symphonia 1 equals the time value if you had 336 16th notes. What's the difference between 336 and 342? It's only six. Six 16th notes. So if I play six 16th notes, there. The time it took me to play those is the only, that's the discrepancy between those two. It's virtually equal, with the only difference being just a few sixteenth notes. That amounts to about one second discrepancy. In other words, if you play Symphonia number one at whatever tempo, pick a tempo, and you you play Symphonia 15 at the exact same 16th note speed, the result will automatically be two pieces of the same duration. 
So let me show you here. If I play, if I play Symphonia One at let's say 54 beats per quarter note. Take those one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, you take those and regroup them into threes. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, you now have 72. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You have 72. So you have 54, you have 72. I'm not saying. That, that that proves Bach wanted those tempi. I'm just saying that my, the point I'm trying to make is not necessarily that those are the correct tempi. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is whatever tempo you play for one, the other one must be the same 16th note speed. So in order to determine that, determine what's possible and what's musical, you have to start with Sinfonia 15, because the 32nd notes, the 32nd notes provide a limit. You can only play them so fast. And so you, what you do is you play Sinfonia 15 at whatever tempo it is, whatever tempo you, you choose for that, and then you take three quarters of that. Three, you take that and you go times, times three divided by four, and that will give you the equivalent 16th note tempo in quarter notes for Sinfonia number one. So let me show you again so you understand. Here's 72. Here's three quarter. Here's a one quarter slower. Three quarters of seventy-two is fifty-four. Nice lyrical piece. So I think that this indicates that. Bach did not want Symphonia 1 fast. Symphonia number 1 is not fast. And this proves it. This proves it. Because Bach was preoccupied with unifying the bookends, like in the Goldberg Variations, like in the Symphonias. He has Symphonia 1, he has Symphonia 15. So this, I think, is a good indication. I believe it proves. I mean, I don't have proof. I don't have 100% proof for it, but I believe it proves. <laughs> and think about it for a while, because what are the chances of it just happening to be 21 measures and 38 measures and happening to have the same number of 16th notes in there? And it just so happens that if you play the 16th note at the same speed, they have the same duration. That's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. I believe that proves that Sinfonia 1 is not fast. I'm going to say that again because a lot of people play Sinfonia 1. Something like that. But if Sinfonia 15 has a limit, that's the optimal tempo for that, you just take that, you regroup the sixteenths and the fours. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, this is what they would have called later in the 20th century as a metric modulation. Bach loved metric modulations. From my analysis of Bach's works, I find this time and time again. He uses these, these um, 
types of metric modulations uh, where he, he might keep the same fast note, but he'll regroup the fast note to um, create a different sounding tempo. So if you, and, and it's, it's really an illusion because when you hear these, if I play this, if I play Symphonia number one at this speed, and I play Symphonia 15 at this speed, and you ask somebody, okay, which one is faster? Which one did I play faster? They'll say, oh, of course, number 15, that was faster. And I'll say, no, <laughs> they were both the same tempo. You see how, how that's an illusion, because it, it sounds faster. But in reality, they're both the same, because they have the same 16th note speed. Let's listen again. percent of human beings would say obviously the second one is faster but I I'll argue with you I'll say no it's not it's not faster it just sounds faster it's really the same because I was playing the same exactly the same 16th notes P uh, pretty soon after this video I'm uploading symphonias 1 and 15 I want you to listen to those. Get a timer and time how long it takes me to play the very first note to the very end when I release everything. I got, I have Symphonia 1 lasts like a minute and 33 seconds. Symphonia 15 is the same thing. It's a minute or like a minute and I think 34 almost 34 seconds. So it's like they're both equal within just one second discrepancy. So 15, if you play it equal 16th notes, they're equal in speed, even though 15 seems faster because it's an illusion. So this is one of the, the, one of the uh, discoveries I made way back in 1992. I've known about this for 30 years and haven't really revealed the secret yet, but I'm revealing the secret to you today. And uh, I hope that you uh, pass along this video to uh, people who might be skeptical or people who might be uh, interested in this sort of thing. And if you're, uh, if you're skeptical about 2138, then all you have to do is look at partita number one. Bach wrote this, or published the six partitas in, I think, 1731. He called it his opus one. He was really proud of the six partitas. It was his first published opus. His actually only published opus. He doesn't have opus two, he just has opus one. And in the six partitas, in the opus one, Bach, Bach puts his signature in the very beginning. He doesn't do the bookends like he does the Goldberg Variations or the Symphonias, but he does it in the Prelude and the um, Allemand. The Prelude and the Allemand. So you have the Prelude from partita number one. Nice, slow, relaxed speed measured by the eighth note. This is subdivided, subdivided eighth note speed. The prelude, or preludium, as he calls it, consists of 21 measures. The alamon consists of 38 measures. So right in the very first two pieces of Bach's Opus 1, he signed his name 
into the first two pieces using the number of measures, 21, 30A, 213A, BACH, in the prelude in Alma. What does this mean for performance? Well, uh, it's a little more obvious than, I think, than Symphonias 1 and 15. In this case, because the prelude is subdivided and it, it's a slow tempo, a very slow quarter note speed, subdivided as an eighth note, note speed. Da, 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 da. Now if you take that eighth note speed and transfer that to the quarter note for the Allemann, you have and you have that. I'm not suggesting any one particular speed, although I, I do have uh, an idea of what I think it is. All I'm saying here is that the 2138 symbolizes BACH, and I believe in this case, just like the Symphonias and just like the bookends of the Goldberg variations, that it's musically appropriate to do a one-two tempo relationship so that both will last the same amount of time. So if you play the prelude at whatever tempo you want for the eighth note speed, and you take that same speed and do the quarter note for the Allemann, I think that that's a very good indication that most people play the Allemann too fast. Okay? M many pianists play this. Something, or maybe a little slower than that, but I've heard it at that speed. So if you do that, if you did that, then, part, then the prelude would have to be so they, they both would just be too fast. So you see that one tempo sets the limits for the other piece and vice versa. So they both work together. And I believe that Bach used 2138 in his partitas, in the first partita, to sign his name. And also, uh, I believe that Bach planned a one-two tempo relationship in there. So they have close to equal durations. They're not, in this case, because he had to use 38 measures instead of 42 measures. 42 measures in the Allemann would have, would have been a perfect... Uh, um, one one duration ratio, but since he had to modify that in order to spell his name the there's not you know you don't have that perfect uh, duration ratio between those two or like you do in the first and fifteenth symphonias anyway, I hope that this uh, um, informs you and uh, tickles your mind a little bit. Uh, I, I wish that you would share this video with others, like I said before, others that may be skeptical and others that may be interested in this sort of thing. So um, stay tuned for more videos like this, subscribe to my channel, and I will keep you updated on uh, my latest research on Bach's tempo practices. Thank you for watching. Until we meet again.